This lecture is part of an online course on Lie groups and will be about the Baker Campbell Hausdorff formula. So, what does this formula say? Well, suppose A and B are n by n matrices over, say, the reals. Then, as we saw in the last lecture, you can try writing x of A times x of B to be x of A plus B, except that because A and B don't commute in general, this formula doesn't actually hold, and you need to add in a correction term, and then you need to add in further higher order correction terms. Oops, I forgot the A there. Um, and so on. And um, what you notice is that all the terms I've written down here can be expressed um, using the matrices A, B we started with and just the Lie bracket. Um, it would be quite trivial to write down a formula like this if we we're allowed to multiply um, matrices together. Um, however, the key point of the Baker Campbell Hausdorff formula is that this expression here only involves the Lie bracket. Um, it converges for A and B small in some sense, in other words, near in some neighborhood of zero, but um, it does not converge in general. Um, in fact, we saw a conse <coughs> consequence of this non convergence in the previous lecture that the exponential map wasn't in general onto, that, uh, that if if the Baker Ham Cam Campbell Hausdorff formula always converged, that, that then we were, would be able to prove the exponential map is onto, but it just isn't. So now let's, uh, before proving the Baker Campbell Hausdorff formula, let's see some applications. So the first application is that a Lie group is determined up to local isomorphism by, um, by its Lie algebra. And this follows fairly easily. So you remember if we have a Lie algebra, which is some sort of vector space, and we had the corresponding Lie group, which is some sort of curved manifold, then you remember the exponential map was an isomorphism between some neighborhood of zero in the Lie algebra and some neighborhood of the identity E in the Lie group. So we had an exponential map and we had its inverse, which was a logarithm map, which didn't actually doesn't actually converge for everything on the Lie group, but at least converges in some neighborhood. And um, what this means that the, the Baker Campbell Hausdorff formula means the product here is determined by the Lie, but by the Lie bracket and the Baker Campbell Hausdorff formula. Because the Baker Campbell Hausdorff formula simply tells you how to multiply two elements in the image of X. Um, incidentally, um, this means there's no need for higher order terms when you try and approximate a Lie group. So you remember the Lie bracket is a sort of second order term. And you could imagine that if you tried writing down this formula here, the, the terms here might be, you know, maybe you'd get a fourth order term that wouldn't be expressible in terms of the Lie bracket. And then you would have to add some sort of complicated fourth order expression in terms of A and B in order to recover the group. Well, that doesn't happen over the reals. Um, the Baker Campbell Hausdorff formula says that the Lie bracket is really all you need to determine the Lie group, at least near the identity. Incidentally, this fails over fields of characteristic p greater than zero. Um, there you find that you can have two algebraic groups in characteristic zero with the same Lie algebra that are not locally isomorphic. Um, in fact, you can see this is going to fail in non-zero characteristic because you have to divide by various integers and you can't do that in characteristic greater than zero. So, so um, 
the, the, the reason why the Lie algebra works well over the reals is because of the baker campbell hausdorff formula. And in cases when it fails, then the connection between the Lie algebra and the group is, is, is much vaguer. So um, next application. Suppose we've got, um, suppose G and H are Lie groups. And suppose we have a homomorphism from the Lie algebra of G to the Lie algebra of H. If G is simply connected um, we get a hom homomorphism from G to H induced by this. Um, well obviously if G isn't connected we've got little hope of um, finding a homomorphism in general because the Lie algebra can only see the connected component of G. Um, so, however, we also need to use the fact that G is simply connected. And to explain why, um, let, let, let's recall what happens in analytic continuation. So in analytic continuation in the complex numbers, suppose you've got some region and suppose that for, you've got an analytic function at some point and suppose you can extend it to some little neighbourhood and then maybe at some point here we can extend it to a little neighbourhood of that point and suppose we can keep on extending it. So um, for each so, so, so for each path in the region, if we've got a path from here to a point over here, we can find we can analytically continue our function at the origin to this point over here. And if we have another path, then we can analytic continue along this other path. And these two analytic continuations aren't necessarily the same. For example, if we take the function log of x, uh, it's not defined at zero, but if we define it at one and analytic continue it along this path to minus one, we find the logarithm should be pi i, but if we analytic continue along this path, we get minus pi i. Um, now, the, 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 the problem here is that these two paths are not homotopic. You can't slide one to the other. You notice if we can slide one path into the other by a sequence of paths like this, then the value by, you would get by analytic continuation would be the same because along any path, all nearby paths give the same value. So if you can sort of slide one path to the other, you get the same analytic continuation. So in a simply connected region, it doesn't matter which path you use to define analytic continuation. Now, um, for defining maps between Lie groups, the argument is kind of rather similar. So if we've got a Lie group here, let's call this Lie group G and draw a picture of Lie group H. And they've got identity elements. And suppose we've got a homomorphism between their Lie algebras, taking G to H. Well, using the baker campbell hausdorff formula, we can use that to define um, a map from a small neighbourhood of G to a small, sorry, a small neighbourhood of the identity in G to a small neighbourhood of the identity in H. Um, and now, um, we, if, if we've got a path in G, we can sort of continue this map along this path um, by using by using the, the the fact that we've got the map defined in a small neighbourhood and using the group operation. I mean, the the, the 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 map from G to H has to be a homomorphism of groups, so we can sort of continue it along like this. Um, but we could also choose another path to continue it along. Um, and there's no particular reason in general why the continuations along these two paths should be the same. For example, if we've got a map from the circle um, to the line, well, we can certainly um, have a local homo homomorphism from the circle to the line. But if we extend it uh, along this path, then it the image sort of looks like that and if we extend it along this orange path then the image sort of looks like that and you see the image of this point is not well defined. However if the Lie group G is simply connected then we see that 
if, if you just slide a path slightly, you're going to get the same continuation. So if you can slide one path into the other, which you can always do if G is simply connected, then the image is going to be well defined and independent of the path. So this shows that Lie algebras are very similar to simply connected Lie groups because homomorphisms between Lie algebras are almost the same as homomorphisms between the corresponding simply connected Lie groups. Um, so now we'll start um, with explaining how to prove the Campbell-Baker-Hausdorff formula. Um, first of all, if we look at the formula, we see it's not really a formula about any particular Lie algebra. We can think of this as a formula about the free Lie algebra on A and B, which is a, a, a sort of algebra generated by A and B, where the only relations you put on them are the axioms for a Lie algebra. So if we can prove this for a free Lie algebra on two generators A and B, then it will automatically be true for all Lie algebras, apart from convergence problems that I'm not going to worry about. So let's start by letting R be the free associative algebra on two elements X and Y. So we can think of this as being non-commutative polynomials. So a typical element might look like something plus something times x plus something times y plus something times x squared plus something times xy plus something times yx plus something times y squared plus maybe higher order terms. And you see the key difference between this and polynomial algebras is that x and y need not commute so we need a term for xy and we also need a term for yx in general. And just as with a polynomial algebra, you can take a completion that's a ring of power series, we can do the same thing. We can take a completion of this, which is a sort of non-commutative power series. And you can check that, that, that if we allow, its elements are going to be sort of infinite sequence infinite sums like this, and you can check that the sum and product of these is well defined, so we get a ring. Um, and what I'm going to do now is to define a coproduct on R hat. So the coproduct will be um, a, well I'm first of all going to define it on R, so it'll be a, a, a ring homomorphism from R to R tensor R. So um, the, uh, it's a ring homomorphism, so you can see R is really the free algebra generated by X and Y. So we can define any ring homomorphism by giving the images of X, which is going to be X tensor 1 plus 1 tensor X, and Y, which is going to be Y tensor 1 plus 1 tensor Y. So this defines a homomorphism from R to R tensor R, and you can easily see that it induces a homomorphism from in the, in the same way to the completion. Um, now I want to explain what this coproduct is. Um, well what it is really is it's a sort of coproduct of a Hopf algebra. Um, so I'll just briefly explain what a Hopf algebra is. This isn't really needed for the proof of the Baker-Campbell-Hausdorff formula, it's just background information. So suppose we take the group algebra um, um, let's say Rg of a group G. So this is an associative algebra where the product is the same as the product of the group G. So it has a product going from Rg tensor Rg to Rg. But it also has a coproduct from Rg to Rg tensored with Rg. And this coproduct is defined as follows. Um, delta of G is equal to G tensor G, whenever G is in, the, is in the group. And it's defined by linearity. And you can check that this is a homomorphism of algebras. Um, 
And these are part of the structure of something called a Hopf algebra. Um, a Hopf algebra also has a unit and a co-unit and um, an antipode that I'm not going to bother to write down because I don't need them, but you can look them up on Wikipedia or something. Um, so a group algebra is a Hopf algebra. And conversely, if you've got a Hopf algebra, it behaves very much like a group algebra. It, it has many of the properties that many things you can do with groups, you can do with Hopf algebras. Um, the, the, the group algebra is a rather special property that its co-product is co-commutative. You see, if you flip these two round, it, it doesn't change it. Um, and Hopf algebras that are where, where the co-product isn't co-commutative are sometimes called quantum groups. So, so that's essentially what a quantum group is. It's more or less the same as a Hopf algebra of a special type. Um, anyway, it turns out that um, from a um, any Lie algebra, you can construct a Hopf algebra. called its universal enveloping algebra. You can never remember how many p's there are in enveloping, um, which we will discuss a, a little bit later. And if you take the freely algebra on two generators, it turns out that its universal enveloping algebra is just the free associative algebra on two generators that we've been talking about. And the um, co-product on this free associative algebra turns out to be the co-product of this considered as a universal enveloping algebra. So that's sort of trying to explain why we're considering the free associative algebra on X and Y and messing around with this funny co-product. Anyway, let's get back to R. We say that an element little r and r is called primitive if Delta R is equal to R tensor 1 plus 1 tensor R. So in particular, X and Y are primitive. Um, and now we notice that the primitive elements form a Lie algebra. Um, and for this, we just need to work out um, so, so suppose R and S are primitive. We need to work out delta of the bracket of R and S. And this is quite easy because it's delta R, delta S minus delta S, delta R, which is equal to R tensor 1 plus 1 tensor R times S tensor 1 plus 1 tensor S plus something similar, which I'm feeling too lazy to write out, or rather minus something similar. And if you multiply this all out, this is equal to Rs tensor 1 plus 1 tensor Rs um, um, plus R tensor S plus S tensor R minus a lot of junk. And um, this turns out to be um, R S minus S R tensor one plus one tensor R S minus S R, which is equal to R S tensor one plus one tensor R S. So, um, so that's a rather nice result because we can get a Lie algebra inside uh, the associative algebra just by taking the primitive elements. Um, Um, now, now let's look at what, what happens to the exponential map. Um, so you remember we've got an exponential map which goes from R to R. Well, it doesn't quite. It, it goes from the elements of R hat with constant term 0 to the elements of R hat with constant term 1. So this is just taking any um, anything so we're just defining x of some non-commutative power series to be 1 plus a plus a squared over 2 and so on. And you can see that this converges if a has zero constant term. And there's an inverse map given by 
the logarithm map where the logarithm of 1 plus something is defined by the usual power series. So these maps are actually bijections um, because we're working with formal power series. So there's no problem with convergence. And primitive elements um, under X are more or less the same as group-like elements. So um, what's a group-like element? Well, it has to satisfy delta of G is equal to G tensor G. So you remember for group rings, the, 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 the actual group elements in the group ring satisfied this, this identity here. Um, there's also another condition saying that the co-unit on this must be one. In other words, it must have constant term equal to one. But, um, so primitive means delta of um, R equals uh, R tensor one plus one tensor R. And that's quite easy to check. Um, for instance, suppose R is primitive, then um, we can work out delta of X of R. It turns out to be X of delta of R because um, since R is a ring homomorphism, it's not difficult to check. It kind of commutes with delta. And this is going to be X of R tensor one plus one tensor R, which is going to be X of R um, tensor one times X of one tensor R which is just equal to um, x of r uh, tensored with x of r. So x of r satisfies the group-like property. And conversely, a very similar calculation shows that if something is group-like, then its logarithm is primitive. So we actually get a bijection between these two objects here. And the primitive elements, as we've just seen form a Lie algebra, and the group-like elements, as you might guess, form a group, which is very easy to check. You can think of this as being an infinite dimensional Lie group, and this as being an infinite dimensional Lie algebra. And we now have an exponential map, which is actually a bijection between the Lie algebra and this group. Um, so now we can try and prove the Baker-Campbell-Hausdorff formula. Well, what we do is we just take x and y in r hat and we know that these are primitive. So x of x and x of y are group-like. You remember this says that delta of a is equal to a tensor a. And this means that x of x times x of y is also group-like because it's easy to check the product of two group-like elements as group-like. And finally, the log of x of x times x of y is now primitive. Um, so uh, this is exactly the term that appears in the Campbell-Baker-Hausdorff formula. Remember, we were saying x of x times x of y is equal to x of um, something. And you notice this something is exactly this expression here. So to finish off, we just have to prove that um, any primitive element of R hat is in the completion of the Lie algebra generated by by x and y. Um, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave this um, to next lecture because it's actually something we'd quite like to prove for all Lie algebras and the universal enveloping algebras and not just this particular special case. Um, this, is, th this fact here is actually a theorem due to Friedrichs. So we're going to postpone this part of the proof of the Baker-Campbell-Hausdorff um, lecture. Um, I'll just finish off by pointing out that there is an explicit form of the
Baker Campbell Hausdorff formula. You notice this is just a sort of abstract existence proof. It shows that there is a formula you can write down in terms of the Lie brackets, but doesn't quite say what it is. Of course, you could work it any work out any finite number of terms you want just by um, brute force. And um, there is an explicit formula for it, and I'm not going to write it down for reasons that will become very obvious in a moment. I'm just going to show you a picture of it, and it looks like this. And it's pretty obvious that if I tried to write it down, I would be almost certain to make a mistake somewhere. Um, so I'm not actually going to. So, so there is an explicit formula, but it's, um, well, it's rather hard to apply because it's so complicated. Um, as you've seen, most of the applications don't actually need the explicit formula. If, if we want to show that um, um, Lie groups are determined up to local isomorphism by the Lie algebra. We don't need the explicit formula. All we need to know is there is some formula like this. OK, so that's all for the baker campbell hausdorff formula. And next lecture we will be discussing universal enveloping algebras and Friedrich's theorem.